Well, just to let everyone know, uh, we're sitting in my living room tonight with Katie Hopkins, and we're so happy to have you here. And she actually joined us for dinner tonight, and she's been on the U.S. world tour uh, <laughs> to save uh, the United States of America. And so, Katie, how, what's the reaction of everyone that you've talked to? How many states have you been to? And what's the general feel for you out there? So I was talking to my children about this today because as I start to head towards the home straight, which is slightly strange actually, because ever since the time I got in here, it's just been onwards, forwards, towards the enemy. And now it feels like, oh no, there's a going home bit. But we were talking about how I needed to get sorted out how many miles, how many states, how many events, how many venues. Um, but since I got here over three and a half months ago, you know, traveling from all the way through LA, from the most northerly point to Newport Beach, uh, coming across Dallas, uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, through to DC, Florida, back to New Jersey, uh, and round back again. You know, it's just been my overriding sense, uh, despite all the darkness, is joy. And our side has been stalwart, our side has been stellar, our side has been the side that's got people together and been uplifted. Uh, our side has involved people who never thought they could ever vote Republican but are finding themselves with us because people just have found out, this has not been, I thought I was coming here to fight for Trump. I'm going over there, I'm gonna fight for Trump. Arr! But actually, it's not been that at all. It's been about bringing people together and bringing people together and making them realize that when we're together, we're the best. Like all we actually want, our side really, is for each other to be the best they can be. Mm -hmm. And they can be anything you want. You can be any type of person you want. You can do what you want with your life. As long as you don't ask me to pay for it, do what the hell you want with your life. Mm -hmm. And that's our side. Mm -hmm. And in a time of lockdown and universal constraint, our side has the kind of ethos that we need in order to take us forward into 2021. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to read something that uh, Katie wrote. When did you write this? What are you reading? Uh, oh, wait. It's part of your diary? You read something. I'm like, it's out of your diary. Why do I write that? Um, this is, these are Katie's words. In 2020, the bravest of us will continue to take a battering for the silent majority in the hope that others may find the moral courage to speak the truth. Yeah, so I wrote that actually back in 2019, and I wanted a way of signing off, and people you would always ask me for bios, right? And I, I hate being introduced when I'm doing a talk. Mm -hmm. I loathe um, that kind of formal introduction thing. It makes me, like everything I am, all of my stomach goes, because people read this long thing that makes you sound really splendid. And there seems to me nothing worse than to start a talk with people who say, well, she's this, and she's the best-selling this, and she does this, and she's fabulous. I'd much rather they were like, well, quite a lot of people think Katie's an asshole, and so here she is. Mm -hmm. And then people would think, oh, she's an asshole. Okay, let's hear her. Mm -hmm. Like, at least you're coming from the point of view of people thinking, maybe she's not that great. So I wrote that as a kind of, um, that's what I am, that's what I know. Those are my people, which, and by my people, I mean us here. People who are authentically in this. So not anybody that's really concerned with studio time and whether they're going to get the next Fox hit or whether they're going to be able to promote some daft book they wrote as if any of us need another damn book to read. People who are authentically in the fight and the joy of being here in your house uh, with these people, as you said to them earlier, is these people are people who are authentically in the fight. And I know it. I know it because you feel it when we speak. Mm -hmm. Our emotions are close to our eyeballs and the back of our mm -hmm. throats. It burns sometimes because we, we feel it as we go. Um, and that's what that phrase was about really is that we'll take the battering, but not we'll take it and we want sympathy or um, we're not asking for anyone to feel sorry for us. We'll take the battering because what we really hope is that we could show you someone else out there that maybe they could make a little stand of their own. And even if that little stand is going and voting on election day, even if you've never voted Trump before, but you know it's the right thing to do for the country, you'll do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we all, and I gesture to people specifically in this room, will take the battering in the hope that you might have the moral courage to do just that. Right. And so it feels really powerful that, and I mm -hmm. know it's what's carried us through, mm -hmm. and you are. I mean, you, you don't take any credit and you won't allow us to talk about you much, I suspect. No, it's really about you tonight. Mm -hmm. But you're the woman <laughs> who 
organized the last time I was here in Minnesota having been in the dark lands of Minneapolis <laughs> coming out to Minnesota to your place to the country to red country seeing that field just full of people patriots shouting for Trump the bikes the trucks the flags that's all you're doing and that's an for us you know that's so uplifting like that day is like seared into my memory mm -hmm. and the stuff I shared from that day those those three gentlemen one of whom was actually incredibly hot yeah I saw like, that I was almost <laughs> like who is that guy <laughs> Uh, those gentlemen at the back of that field with their truck. That was real mm -hmm. America. Mm -hmm. And a, the rest of the world wants to feel that. And you brought that. Mm -hmm. You made other people feel real America. And that's incredible. That's so powerful. That's you. Thank you. Um, I just, I want to go back to that. I think that there was something, though, that inspired those words. Was there some type of an awakening for you, or is it something that you've seen globally or just to America or to your own country that inspired those words? Because those words are, to me, are pretty deep, and I think that those words are uh, a call to action for people to, to stop being the silent majority. Yeah, those words came out the back of a particularly rough time. And I say that as someone who's, you know, lost every job they've ever had or, you know, they came from my home, they come from my kids, they report my kids to social services. Uh, in the UK, I'm not allowed to adopt should I wish to because I'm not an appropriate person to be a mother because of my views. Um, my children have to have interviews in their bedrooms about whether they're being abused or not because that's my the people who seek to silence me know that really your children are a line, aren't they? Um, police came to my home. Police waited till my husband had gone to do a swim drop. One of my children swims. You know, you do a swim drop. They waited till he drove out and then they came. The police came from way up in Sharia-controlled bits of England and they came for my son and my daughter and they they were in, weren't even in police uniform and they... I would say bullied my children into handing over stuff and intimidated my children and said, your mummy is in trouble. We need you to get a hold of your mummy. And, and there, were the, there was moments like that and all I had done was speak out about, against the paedophile grooming gangs, majority Pakistani Muslim paedophile grooming gangs, and they came for my two youngest kids. And so it, there was a moment where you have to work through that. People say of our side, you know, oh, it's water off a duck's back or you've got the skin of a rhino or you know, got the hide of an elephant. And I know that's a lie. I don't. We don't. Actually, I think probably many of the people in this room are some of the softest people I know. I, I describe myself, ourselves, I see us like little walking hearts on two legs. Like we're just like actually these big hearts that can't help but want to save everybody. Mm -hmm. So it really hurts. And there was a time I was really hurt. I, I always say they won't stop until I'm swinging from a tree. And I say that for everybody here, Laura Luma, Milo, anybody, any of us, they won't, Michelle Malkin, they won't stop until we're swinging from a tree. And there's times, rationally, as an adult, you consider that if you removed yourself, it may give your children the opportunity to live a life without being a target. So this swinging from a tree is not just a throwaway line. There are times you consider removing yourself in order to try and sustain your children's life. And that phrase came out of that. And it was more a reconciling that I'm, this fight is still on, mm -hmm. that I'm not going to swing from a tree, that mm -hmm. I'll protect my children in other ways um, and that will continue. And I think this idea that we prevail is so strong for me because when we prevail, we ultimately triumph. Mm -hmm. So it, it did come from a very dark time where I had considered removing myself from the planet in order just to give my children a breathing space. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Yes, um, because it's really hard to find people who um, are brave like you, and there is not a lot of us out there. And I just, I want, I want you to encourage people to stop being the silent majority, Katie. I think that you understand that, uh, I know you love President Trump, everyone in this room, we love President Trump, and um, the thing that we hear a lot is, you know, President Trump's got this, he's taking care of us, 
And I'm constantly pleading with people, please don't say that. It's up to us to stand up and help him. And, and to, it's, I believe it's every citizen's responsibility to, um, if you're voting or otherwise, it doesn't matter if you're not voting. It, this is your country, this is your home. And we personally have to be responsible um, for defending it and keeping it our country. And so the silent majority, I think, is uh, something that needs to be kind of eliminated where we're actually rising up now and taking back um, our country. And, you know, I, I'm very hopeful that President Trump is going, we're going to have him another four years. And, you know, we don't, we, we're not guaranteed something tragically could happen. But if we just can't be complacent for the next four years and think everything's going to be okay yeah and I think you know there's some warriors out there so you're not on your own here in Minnesota Minneapolis even though it can feel like it and I know that here you know Minneapolis having lived it a little bit this is the dark lands you know I describe Minneapolis as the dark lands and I feel it it's like a vortex that sucks you in there is darkness in MSP because of Ilhan Omar and all of the jihadi um, sisterhood that she cultivates there but um, you know what I do see is this huge army of people who are saying unsilent. I mean, Brandon Strack in New York when we were there, or in D.C. Sorry, unsilent. That was the name of the weekend. Mm -hmm. Three thousand people gathering to say we won't be silent anymore. Scott Presler with his pickups. You know these mm -hmm. these great people out there just worrying away. They, they are the volunteers. They're mm -hmm. the ones without the, you know network uh, contacts but they're just doing it because of the love of people and what's so joyous i think i've spent a, quite a bit of time on ranges uh, from california right across to florida and number one you cannot buy a weapon anymore in america they're sold out they're sold out through california through dallas texas up through florida they're sold out you can't buy ammunition anymore it's sold out i sat with a woman in dc and she was from oregon and they just lost their homes. They burnt to wildfires or fires started by whomever. And they'd had Portland down the road. And she looked me in the eye and she said, I'm a grandmother. I'm, I've done it. I had a great life. If they come for me on the 4th, or well, this doesn't go the way, or it goes our way and they still come, and they will. Mm -hmm. She said, they'll come on my property. They won't leave my property. Mm -hmm. and, and she, her steely eyes, I've, it's out there on social media. People are like, you could see she means that. Mm -hmm. Last night in Florida, I was with an 80-year-old gentleman. He's a surgeon, brilliant man. I've lived my life. I'm a grandfather now. If they steal this election from Trump, I'm signing up and I'm going down fighting. I will not live under Biden. So I'm telling you, the, the, this idea of a silent you know, majority, I'm not so sure anymore. I think there's a majority. I put it out there today about this gentleman. And I'm 25, I'm signed up. I'm 55, I'm in. I'm 45, I'm in too. I don't know that there's a silent majority because if they try and take this election, that Trump will fairly win. Mm -hmm. I th believe there will be a fight back like America has never seen. Mm -hmm. And the joy, you know, some of the joyous stories I have, we could probably get to a few of them, are the thing that lifts me up. Mm -hmm. Like I, I feel overwhelmed with positivity coming through the states that I've come through. And that isn't just sitting in Trump houses, feeling good about supporting Trump. Right, right. This is being out in crazy places, crazy things happening, but all of them aligning to show America has had enough. You can only push us so far. Mm -hmm. And it's, we've been pushed to the, I say we, I'm a foreigner, but we've been pushed to the very edge. Mm -hmm. And this is not an election about red or blue, Republican or Democrat. This is for American values and people are going to come with us. And even after the election day, they're going to join up and fight back. I think it's biblical in proportion. And I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. So let's talk about Islam. Okay, let's do okay, it. Okay, let's do that. Um, I would like to know how uh, Britain, London, what do, you, what do you guys call it? UK. The UK. How is the UK assimilating to all your invaders? Mm. And, you know, the... UK has been taken over by <laughs> Islam completely mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately. So there is no, the Britain will fall to Islam within the decade. By 2030, Muslim births outnumber births to all others. Number one name in the UK is Mohammed. The number two name is Muhammad. Uh, by 2040, white Brits and Brits are a minority in their own land. I'm already a white minority Christian minority in London, Luton, Bradford, Leicester, Birmingham, Bradford. 
And in those cities, there's no go zones where police will not go, where Sharia is enforced, where the mosques are the dominant powerhouse. Uh, I have it firsthand from police serving police officers, Muslims and Imams dictate which police are allowed to patrol certain areas. Um, and we see it already, white girls abused by majority Pakistani Muslim men, picked up by Muslim police, taken to the Imam. So it never even touches with any system of law and order that maybe we used to know. Power is in the hand of the Muslim majority. In any future government knows the only way they can get power after Boris Johnson's government is with the Muslim majority. So the only way to get power in the UK going forwards is with the Muslim majority. And all I can say to the leftist and LGBTQ, RSPTUV, mm -hmm. people is you damn well start better building single story homes. Because mm -hmm. I tell you what's happening next in the UK, LGBTQ, whatever, I don't care how you want to live your life, it's not my business. You're not going to even exist in 10 years time in the UK. And that's when the conflict's going to start to show itself. Mm -hmm. Because tolerating the intolerant means that LGBTQ can't live, exist in the UK. And we already have it happening. Muslim parents barricading schools because they don't want that stuff taught in schools. Now, as it happens, I agree with them. I don't want that stuff taught in schools either. Mm -hmm. But it's the fact that they are the ones with the power right. to stop schools teaching it. In my country, they have the power. Mm -hmm. And so my Jewish friends are moving out to the homeland. They'll move to Israel. 8,000 Jews left Paris last year. Paris will fall first. We fall next. Uh, they hunt us down and we will either move to Hungary, Poland, Eastern Europe, or we'll pull out somewhere else. And the emails I get, I could pick up my phone now and show you 20 emails today from people asking me, Katie, where do we go? Uh, people know the end is in sight. And so that's always been my work here in America for the last 10 years, probably, is telling people don't fall as we have fallen. Mm -hmm. And of course, now that feels acute. And I think actually right here, Minneapolis, Minnesota is, I don't want to say a perfect template because it's hideous, but you are following the playbook mm -hmm. letter by letter, right. the excavation of everything that you are, the hollowing out of your center with the majority Muslim population, which then dictates the color of your state. Right. And of course, Minnesota is red, but because of the ridiculous epicenter of Minneapolis and Paul's and, you know, the jihadi massive, it reads blue. And that's precisely what they did to London, Bradford, Birmingham, Luton, Leicester. We fell before you ever came near us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how are your fellow citizens responding to the takeover of your country? Have they just given up? Are people in denial of it? Do are people just accepting it, or what's the response been? Yeah, and it's I mean it's hideous, and there's reasons for it too. It's not just that British people have been schooled for two decades now that you don't speak, you don't say anything, you keep your head down. You want your job? You don't want to become like Katie Hopkins? Then you be quiet and you you stay back there. They've been schooled in that. You know, when we had the COVID lockdowns, you could see the bubbling up in certain states here, South Dakota, other places, governors having, you know, the, the currency to get amongst it. None of that for us. British citizens stood on their doorsteps at 8 p.m. on a Thursday evening, dictated by the state, and they applauded at the sky. This sounds like a crazy idea. <laughs> we had to stand on our doorsteps and clap at the sky in support of our socialized healthcare service. And if you didn't, neighbors took footage of your front door and said, oh, where's Michelle then from number 24? She doesn't deserve healthcare. If she gets sick, we should put something on her door to show that she shouldn't be saved. Her children shouldn't get healthcare because she didn't even want to clap at the sky. That's the UK. Like, Orwellian doesn't even come close to it. Mm -hmm. And that's why the left are pushing and foisting so hard socialized healthcare on you because that's the brute force mm -hmm. of the sort of group thing that drives you crazy. So British people dissolved a long time ago because we were schooled that we'll take everything from you and your home and your marriage and your everything and we'll come for your head. But also, of course, you have fundamental differences here in America. You still have your faith. You are one nation under God. And, uh, you know, I've stood with pastors who kept their doors open of their churches in California. Mm 
mm-hmm. and their congregation has increased five times. I mean, it's emotional. Pastor Tim has to have five services on a Sunday just to get people in. One nation under God prevails here. Our churches and our mosques. Uh, you have your f- so faith. You have the, your family, um, and I'll come back to that. And you have this freedom of your constitution, your Second Amendment, and the joy of all this weapon purchasing isn't just that I like the fact that people have semi-automatic weapons, um, which are my favourite weapon, by the way. Uh, it's that um, the Second Amendment have ne- has never ever been so robust. I'd argue, Mm -hmm. in modern history in America. Mm -hmm. Because more weapons are currently stored in households and depots across America than has ever been in modern times. That, for me, if if COVID did anything, it made the Second Amendment come alive. Mm -hmm. And that's just such a joy. Because of your Second Amendment, you have your first. And just finally, just one thing I I really want to articulate that I forget sometimes, is just to say that British people aren't all pathetic. And I never want to do them a disservice in that way. I signed up to for serve in my military because I love my country. Mm-hmm. 20 million Brits, at least if not more, decent Brits who voted for Brits are with you. You know, they message me, tell them, Katie, tell them, you know, mm-hmm. tell them, uh, tell them. <clears throat> See, this is why I can't hang out with my friends. <laughs> tell them that we're with them. And British people, decent British people, uh, are fearful that you think we're represented by our Muslim mayor of London or the horrible balloon of Trump or whatever. That's not us. Mm-hmm. We're with you. And so if there's one thing I can do here, and it doesn't matter to me if this all ends tomorrow, uh, it's to let you know that 20 million or so decent British people are right with you. Thank you. Katie, I want to talk about the mask. Um, I look at the mask. We we all know now that it's really uh, the whole COVID's real, but um, how it's being used uh, is to basically destroy our country. And the left has really taken hold of this masking. And I view this as um, the best opportunity for Americans to stand up and put up a fight without anyone having to lose their life. Yeah. And, and it's very discouraging uh, because your country definitely has gone down a road way beyond where we're at. And I look at this, this hideous but yet simple piece of cloth mm-hmm. as the perfect opportunity for Americans and patriots to stand up and tell the government, back off, we will not comply, we are our own people, and screw you, (laughs) F off government. (laughs) So sorry, there we go. I didn't say the word, but it it to me is like the best opportunity for Americans to tell the government to stuff it. Oh, it it is, and it's a joy. You know, I've I've found the mask to be a joyous thing in many regards. Number one, I watch people all over, and the way they take the mask off tells me who they are. So before we may have had a Trump pin or a Mm -hmm. T-shirt, you know, uh, with Trump on. Now I can tell by the way someone takes that thing off their face if they're with us and it allows me to have a conversation with them and I just find it joyous. Uh, second up, so yesterday in Florida I was walking to, I was going to get a pedicure because I was trying to be a grown up American because you all have really good toenails and British people don't. <laughs> and I walked down the street and I got one done and then as I'm walking down the road it's blazing hot sunshine so I've got no mask on and you're supposed to have a mask everywhere. And then I took my shoes off because I needed my toenails to dry. So I'm walking down the side of a road. No one walks obviously in America. They think I'm homeless and a drunk. <laughs> no mask on, no shoes on which I'm loving because it feels more free than ever. Like I just look like a homeless drunk gypsy. <laughs> and then these guys go past with their big flags, the Trump flags and the America flags and they're honking on their horn giving me this out the window like some old lady with no shoes on because they're like free she's free like it was it was a moment and then we had that together with people just driving I mean they probably felt sorry for me I'm surprised no one chucked ten dollars at me to be honest and then another thing just really briefly but it's a great story in California so go into the post service I was trying to send something home US United States Postal Service yes USPS guy behind the counter has got blue hair in a mohawk like a massive spike so I'm going in, I'm thinking, I need to get this posted, be nice, be kind, don't, you know, don't be Trumpy, just because this is a Democrat, blue hair. 
I go up and we're sorting it out and I've got my mask on. He's got his mask on and his visor and his blue hair. And then a lady comes in next to me and to the next counter. And lockdown has made many people actually very unkind. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame them. I understand it. Older people in particular, they small things wind them up more. My parents are the same. She came in and she had a beef and she had something to say and something hadn't gone the way she wanted. She had this letter in her hand. It obviously hadn't posted the way she wanted. And she let rip at this lady behind the counter. And I, and I thought, no, 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 no. So I pulled down my mask and I turned to the lady and I said, I'm very sorry. If you're going to speak to somebody at the USPS in that manner, I'm going to need you to leave this store. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I don't know if it's the British accent or, you know, I have some stature when I get going. She left the store. And I was like, okay, that went well. Because I don't know what actually what I would have done. And she said, no, I'm not going to. I'd have to like arm wrestle her out of there. It would have been unattractive. <laughs> anyway, so I look back to the gentleman with the blue hair and I go, oh, sorry. And I go to pull it back up. And he goes, actually, I think it's a load of bollocks as well. Takes his visor off, takes his mask down because he was grateful that I'd stood up for his colleague and I went, well, now you come to mention it, I'm also a massive Trump supporter and I'm here to fight for Trump. <laughs> and he went, I'm a massive Trump supporter too. That's awesome. And that's a guy with blue hair in the USPS who I pinged as a Democrat, wasn't at all, saw that we're the side trying to be decent and just went, yeah, I'm with you too. And the lady was as well. And that just makes me think, we don't even know what we, we think these are the silent people because we judge them ourselves. Mm -hmm. I did but they're with us as well. Lyft drivers, Uber drivers, every time I'm just like, well, I think you should know I'm a truck. They'll tell me they are too. Mm -hmm. I just feel it. I feel it. It's coming good. Mm -hmm. and, and COVID and lockdown and the masks have actually been a conduit for people to say, no, that isn't what I signed up for at any level of politics. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's brought us some superstars like Christy Noam, South mm -hmm. Dakota, mm -hmm. 2024. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Or just marry me. I don't mind going <laughs> I know, to, right? I'll just swap She's sides. Hard, isn't she? I'll swap teams <laughs> any day of the week. Yeah. So this is your second trip back to Minnesota. What's, what's the deal on that? <laughs> I know. I left. So like, I will never go back to the dark That's lands. what we always say too. <laughs> right. And I'd gone, you know, like when I was here, I was like going to some special places in my little, I went to Walmart and bought myself a Walmart outfit so I would fit right in. And I was like, I never go back there in my life. No, I didn't mean it. But the more I was away, the more it pricked my conscience that the fight's here. Minnesota can go red. Women in the suburb need to wake up. There's still damage I can do to the other Good. side. <laughs> we like that. <laughs> and the lazy thing to do is to not do the hard thing. And right. I like the hard thing. So then I was like, I'm coming back. So yeah, it's just about coming back. So over the next couple of days, I'm not entirely sure where I poke up and how, but I think there's still some real damage that can be done and I'm all in. So whatever that is, it's what I plan to do.